All right. Everyone hear me okay? We're good? Okay, awesome. Uh, for everyone who doesn't know, my name is Joshua Wagner. Um, I usually am in the back, so I'm on the opposite side of the church uh, this morning. Um, so you may be wondering what I'm doing up here. Pastor Kelly is off on a trip, and so uh, I came in about a month ago um, helping doing some work on the sound room, and by the time I left, I had somehow agreed to do this with a handful of books. And uh, so there's a moral in there somewhere, a lesson. Uh, I don't know what the lesson is, so I'm going to be talking about something else today. Um, so if you could go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Philemon. Uh, so Philemon is a very short book in the New Testament. It's in between the books of Titus and Hebrews. Um, and Philemon is very unique in the sense that it's a very personal letter um, that's sent from Paul to um, the man who sends it to is the name of the book, Philemon. Um, so before we get started, I'm just going to try to give a little bit of historical context and a little bit of personal context to see where everyone's at uh, during this time. Um, so Paul, at this time, it's um, estimated that this book was written around uh, 60 to 63 AD. Uh, Paul is in Rome, and he's under house arrest. Um, he is waiting to appeal to speak to the Emperor Nero at the time. Um, so he's not locked away in a dungeon. He is uh, mostly under house arrest, so he is, um, people are able to come in and visit him. He's able to go out uh, in limited faction, fashion, um, and he is getting kind of old. In the book, he actually calls himself Paul the Aged because uh, he's in roughly around his uh, early to mid-60s at this time, um, which, you know, in the classical age, this is the first century AD, um, there's no vaccines, no modern medicine, uh, and also when you look at Paul's personal life or his, his story of, of his mission trips and everything, um, you know, he's gone through a really rough time. So he's been flogged multiple times. He's been uh, stoned by an angry crowd. Uh, he's been in prison and dungeons. He's been in multiple shipwrecks. And so all that all together, he is in kind of a rough physical shape. Um, and so you see that in the letter, uh, he has a man who's taking care of him whose name is uh, Timothy. And it's the same Timothy as... Uh, he wrote the books of First and Second Timothy for. Um, so he's, he's under house arrest. He's writing this letter to Philemon. Philemon, it's a Greek name. Uh, it basically means friend or friendly. Uh, and Philemon is um, a, a member of the Church of Colossae. And Colossae right now, are in the modern day, is located in western Turkey. Uh, so it's about a thousand miles or so from the city of Rome. And uh, Philemon is very, he's a very wealthy man, and so he owns a very large house, and so that is where the Church of Colossae actually meets. They meet here at Philemon's house, because for the first 200 years or so of uh, early church history, um, people would always just meet at whoever had the biggest house, basically. And uh, for the city of Colossae, that would be Philemon. He's a very wealthy man, and he is also a slave owner. Um, and the reason why that's relevant is because there's a third character, or a third man in the story, and his name is Onesimus. And Onesimus, um, at this time, is a slave. And he is specifically Philemon's slave. And Philemon is a Christian, uh, and he owned a slave. And so Onesimus, kind of to give the backstory, uh, he at first was a pagan. Uh, he escaped from, uh, he escaped from um, Philemon, and he ran away. And he ran away all the way to the city of Rome. Uh, we don't know why he went to Rome. Uh, there is some hypothesis that maybe he was familiar with Paul because uh, Paul was a friend of Philemon. So it's possible that he knew of Paul and was trying to find Paul. It's also possible that as a runaway slave in the Roman times, uh, runaway slaves could be harshly punished. They could be tortured or even killed. And so he was trying to go to the largest, basically, city in order to, for him to try to disappear. So either way, he makes his way to Rome, and he's able to find uh, Paul. He somehow runs into Paul. And Paul evangelizes to him. He shares the gospel with him and Onesimus becomes saved. He becomes born again. And so Onesimus stays and helps to take care of Paul for a while. Um, and then we don't know what happens. We don't know the conversations that took place. But Onesimus ends up going back to Philemon, um, his former master or his current master, depending on how you look at it. Um, and he doesn't go alone. He goes with a man named Tychicus. And actually, Paul sends him uh, both of them with two letters. Uh, so he sends them with the letter to Philemon, which is the one we're going to go over today. And he also sends them with a larger letter 
that goes specifically to the whole church of Colossae, uh, which we now know as the book of Colossians. So these are two books that are written later on in Paul's life, and they're kind of partners. So you see there's a lot of parallels. Uh, in the book of Colossians, Philemon is not mission, mentioned, but Onesimus is. And um, so you see his name. We'll go over that a little bit. Um, and so it's also important to look at the cultural context of what slavery was um, in the time of, of the Roman era. So a lot of times as Americans, whenever we think of slavery, what, brings up, what comes up to mind is images of the antebellum South. Um, so African slaves or descendants of Africans uh, were enslaved, usually largely agri agri agricultural. Um, they didn't know how to read or write, uh, uneducated, treated horribly. Um, and in the Roman times, so this is about you know, 2,000 years ago, it's three, four, five thousand 5,000 miles away. It was a different time in Rome. Slavery was still a thing, but it was different in a lot of regards. Um, it was similar in the fact that masters still owned their slaves, and uh, legally they could you know, beat them, kill them, do whatever they want. Uh, and there are stories of that. Uh, so basically a story is a man was vid visiting his rich friend. Uh, they were both Romans, so this is not a, this is not a Bible story. But, uh, and he said, oh, I've never seen someone die before. And so the master says, oh, I'll show you. And so he just calls a slave, and he kills the slave right in front of him just so that they could watch him die. And so this is kind of an example of how poorly slaves were treated back then. Uh, but also, um, slavery was different at that time as well. Uh, it was different because it wasn't racially, uh, there wasn't that racial component to it in the same way that we think about it in America. Um, so a white man could own a black slave, a black man could own a white slave. Um, at this time, and it was more about um, usually the way you became a slave is you were either born a slave or the biggest way that people became slaves is that uh, the Roman Empire would go out, they would conquer a region, and they would take their people back and they, and they would make them into slaves. Um, and then also the third way the person would become a slave would they be, they would um, be in a lot of debt. So you were in a lot of debt, you couldn't pay it off. In order to pay off your debt, you would either sell yourself or often sometimes their children into slavery in order to try to pay off that debt. Um, and these are called bond servants. Um, and so also another way that slavery is different in the Roman at this time is that um, as a slave, you could buy your own freedom and you could become a Roman citizen. Uh, slaves, were, they were able to own property in different ways than we think of today in American slavery. Um, and they could actually you know, either or be freed by their masters and they could be seen as Roman citizens. Um, and so, uh, in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, uh, the word slave, or it's a Greek word which means, uh, which is doulos, uh, which in the King James Version, a lot of times when you see the word servant in English, that is that word doulos, which means slave. Um, and so you see that a lot of times. Um, there's a lot of metaphors for Christians, for us, how we are no longer you know, servants or slaves to sin, but we become slaves to Christ. And so it's interesting how that, um, that word is used a lot of times it's a metaphor for Christians. Uh, so basically, this is where Onesimus is at, right? So he escapes from Freeliman, he becomes saved, and he's going back um, to basically go to his master. Because at this time, uh, in the Roman times, it was seen as, um, you know, it's, it was a bad thing for slaves to run away, um, just because uh, it, it, the way they looked at it from a cultural uh, standpoint is that the masters did own the slaves. Um, and a lot of times, slaves would sell themselves into slavery. So if you, if you ran away, then you would be kind of seen as, um, it was very important. So it's, it's important that when we're looking at the context of this book, that we try to look at it beyond ourselves, right? We don't put our own values. We don't think about slavery in the way that it was here in the States. We look at it in a way uh, that it is, or it was back in the Roman times. And through looking at it that way, it'll help us better understand uh, where Paul is coming from, where Philemon is coming from, and where Onesimus is coming from and the consequences and what these words actually mean. So um, Paul sends Philemon, or Onesimus, back to Philemon, and um, he sends him back with this letter. And this letter is to Philemon specifically, and it's a way that Paul intercedes for, on the sake of Onesimus. A lot of times, like I said earlier, um, runaway slaves would be punished. Um, so Onesimus does have the chance of being punished when he comes back to Philemon. Um, and in the letter, we see that Philemon, or Paul intercedes and acts as an intermediary uh, between Philemon and, um, and Onesimus. So that's kind of where we're starting off. That's the historical context. That's a little bit of the cultural context.
So we're going to get started, and we are going to look at um, the first verse. So we're just going to go you know, take it, um, a few verses at a time, and we're going to see uh, if we can work our way through the book. Um, and before we start, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and pray real fast, and then uh, we can get started. Uh, dear God, just thank you so much for today. Thank you for um, allowing us to come here and to learn from your word. Um, please allow, uh, put your words in my mouth. Help me to say the things that you would want me to say. Um, and I just pray that we uh, all learn something from your word and learn to be closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so starting off in verse 1, this is typically the greeting uh, that um, Paul starts off in all of his letters. So he starts off, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, unlike some other letters in the New Testament, this is very clearly, uh, we don't know exactly who wrote it, such as the book of Hebrews. Um, this one is very clearly Paul. Uh, and he says his first name. Uh, this is kind of how he opens it up. But it's interesting how he calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ, because that's not often how he introduced himself. So if we remember, uh, the book of Colossians was kind of the brother letter to this book. It was sent at the same time. It was written at the same time. So if we skip back to the book of Colossians, which is just a few books back, and we can see how Paul introduced himself in that, introduced himself in that book. So Paul starts off the book of Colossians saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. So it's interesting that whenever Paul writes to the church in Colossae, Colossae he kind of starts with his official title. And he is showing that he is an authority figure, that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, and he's kind of starting off, like, th th this is his authority. But when he start reading, he's writing to Philemon, who is a friend, who is a personal friend. He doesn't call himself an apostle. He calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Um, and he calls himself this. In a way, he starts to humble himself. And he shows him that he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He is under house arrest at this time. Uh, and in the same way, he's, trying to, he's drawing a comparison between him as Paul and Onesimus. Uh, because at the time of you know, the Roman times, uh, there wasn't a huge difference between prisoners and slaves. Uh, prisoners didn't have rights. They were locked away. They were incapable of having any freedoms. They couldn't go where they wanted, do what they want. And so in this way, he's kind of drawing a comparison. He's comparing himself to the state that Onesimus is in. Uh, and then he mentions Timothy, our brother. And he calls Philemon our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. So, once again, kind of with our own American values, a lot of times, since we know that Philemon owns slaves, we'll, we, could, we would look back and say, well, he must have been a bad Christian, right? Because slavery is bad, and um, it's a sinful act. But according to Paul, throughout the book of Philemon, uh, Paul praises Philemon in a way that shows that Philemon is actually a very strong Christian. He's very loving, uh, and he's, he's shown to be a great example for the love of Christ to the world and also to the saints. Um, so verse number two, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Uh, so it's estimated, or it's um, that Aphia, it's, um, it's possible that this is his wife, because um, it is a personal letter once again. And then Archippus is maybe his son, we don't know for sure. Uh, and it says, and to the church in that house. So once again, he, um, Philemon, uh, he basically, all the church meets in his house. Um, and then grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so this is just a, a greeting from Paul. So starting off uh, in verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and towards all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So once again, um, kind of in this section, verses 4 through 7, Paul is talking about what he loves about Philemon. Uh, so he thanks God for him. He makes his, mentions him in his prayers always and continuously. Uh, and he's even heard of his love. So he says in verse 5, Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints. So even though Paul is a thousand miles away uh, in Rome and Philemon is in Turkey, or modern-day Turkey, uh, Paul has heard of Philemon's love, and he's heard of his faith. And so that's how uh, great of a leader in the spiritual realm that Philemon is, 
uh, and the communication of, my faith, of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by these brothers. So uh, whenever we see in verse 7 the word bowels, uh, what it means kind of depends on the context. So you actually see the mentioning of the word bowels um, many times in this book. Uh, in the context of verse 7, it really means the heart. So the heart of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So Philemon is a great encourager, um, and he serves as a great man of God who comes and uh, encourages the saints. And starting in verse 8 is where Paul begins to mention um, Onesimus. Uh, so the first part of the letter, verses 1 through 7, uh, Paul comes to Philemon, he greets him, he introduces himself, and he begins by talking about uh, the great things that, who, who Philemon is and how he has great affection for him. Uh, in verse 8, he begins to speak about Onesimus. Uh, so, wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Um, so, in these two verses, Paul is basically saying, and it's important that we, like, we point again to the fact that Paul doesn't introduce himself as an apostle, uh, because in verse 8 he says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ, to enjoin thee that which is convenient. So he's basically saying that as an apostle of Christ, I could tell you what to do in this case, because he's sending Onesimus back. He wants Onesimus and Philemon uh, to be rectified again uh, as new brothers in Christ. And he says that I, uh, I could compel you or I could urge you or ask you or to tell you basically what to do, the right thing to do to bring Onesimus back uh, into the church. But in verse 9 he says, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ. So he says, instead of urging you, instead of telling you, I'm going to ask you. Um, and he does that out of love for Philemon. He does that because he does not want to hold his authority over Philemon as uh, an apostle. And here he also mentions that he is Paul the aged, and he also mentions again that he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So once again, he's showing that you know, he's done all these great things for Christ. He has basically, um, you know, if he was... Uh, in Master's Club, he'd have all the badges, but he's basically saying that, you know, instead of telling, he's going to ask. Verse number 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sinned again. Thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. Um, so in verse 10, he begins to beg for forgiveness for Onesimus and acceptance for Onesimus. Uh, and he says that he has begotten him in his bonds. So basically this is him, uh, Paul, referencing to the fact that while he was bonds, while he was a prisoner, he has uh, spiritually begotten Onesimus. So he evangelized to him and Onesimus became saved. And you can see throughout this letter that Paul refers to Onesimus as his son. And uh, that demonstrates how we as church members should see each other that we're not just members in the same building or members of the same church, but we really are family and uh, that we should see each other as such. So uh, verse number 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. And so verse number 11 is um, the Paul, he does kind of a play on words. So anisimus is a Greek word and it means profitable. Um, it's very common because um, in the Roman times, a lot of times slaves didn't really have names. Um, in the Roman society, basically the more names you had, um, the, the more pristine, the more elegant, the more high you were kind of on the hierarchy. So uh, like Julius Caesar, I don't remember his full name, but he, was, uh, he had like five names um, altogether. And slaves often didn't even have one. Uh, a lot of times, depending on where they were from, like if they were a slave from Sicily, uh, they would just call him the Sicilian rather than actually give him a name. So it's possible Onesimus isn't really his name. Um, it's possible he doesn't have one. This is just what he's called. But Onesimus means profitable. And so Paul is saying uh, that which in time past was to thee unprofitable. So he's saying that Onesimus was once un unprofitable because he was not saved. He was a pagan. But he's now profitable to thee and to me. Um, and so Onesimus comes back saved. He comes back uh, in the eternal glory of Christ. And so now Onesimus is both profitable uh, to thee and to me. So he's saying he's like, he's not profitable be, to you because he's a slave, but he's profitable to you because he's a brother in Christ. Uh, 
Uh, so starting in verse 12, when I have sinned again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. So once again, we see uh, that um, Paul refers to him as his own son. And so when he says mine own bowels in this context, he means that basically he is his son. Um, Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me, and to the, in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. Um, so in, verse, in these two verses, Paul is saying that he wishes that Onesimus had stayed to take care of him. Because Onesimus obviously has a gift for service. He's helping to take care of Paul along with uh, Timothy. Uh, and he says, I would have rather him to have stayed with me and helped to minister unto me. Uh, but uh, without thy mind would I do nothing. So he's saying that he doesn't want to, um, he, doesn't, he, wouldn't, he would feel like that would be wrong to do without Philemon's permission. Because it's important to realize that in this context, they do live in the Roman world. They live under Roman law. And under Roman law, um, Onesimus still is kind of a convict on the run. He's still an escaped slave. And he, cannot buy, he, he can only buy his own freedom if he buys it from his master um, at this time. And so under state law, under the law, Philemon is still his master. Uh, and so he says um, so that he doesn't want... He wouldn't want Onesimus to stay there, basically, without uh, Philemon's say-so. Um, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. So he wants him to stay there willingly and not out of necessity. Uh, so in verse 15, so, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldst receive him forever. Um, and this verse is really important, because this is Paul asking Philemon to look at things differently. Uh, Philemon would have the temptation to say, you know, I paid a lot of money for a slave. He ran away. There is some, uh, it doesn't say in the scripture itself, uh, but there is some um, theories that Philemon not only ran away, but also stole some money from Philemon as he ran away. Uh, the trip from Colossae to Rome is very long. It's very dangerous. Uh, as an escaped slave, he wouldn't have a lot of money to pay for that. So it's possible that he not only ran away, but also stole some money from Philemon as he went. Um, so, but Paul is saying, you need to look at it differently. Rather than saying, oh, he ran away, but now he's back, you need to look at it from more of an eternal standpoint. Um, so he departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him forever. So you lost a slave, but when he came back, he came back as a brother in Christ who um, will be saved forever. And then here's in verse 16. So not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me. But how much more unto thee both in the flesh and in the Lord. And this is something that's very radical at the time, right? Um, so there were slaves, there was slavery, and there was a definite hierarchy where uh, you know, masters were up here, slave owners were up here, and slaves were down here. But Paul is saying that, um, that he should not receive Onesimus back as a servant, and that's that word duolo, so it's, it's a slave, but above a slave, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So he says, I don't want you to receive him as a slave coming back, but I want you to receive him as a brother, a brother in Christ and a brother uh, basically in the flesh, literally. And so now that he has made his petition for Onesimus, uh, Paul goes again to speak to Philemon in verse number 17. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. So this again also leads people to believe that um, Onesimus has done more than just run away, that maybe he stole something. Uh, but Paul basically intercedes for him, and he, and he acts in a very Christ-like way here. So the story of Christ, uh, the story of you know, our salvation is that we have sinned, we have the burden of sin, and it's a burden of sin that we cannot cast away ourselves. We can't do good works. We can't do anything that would allow us to, um, to basically to cast off that weight of the sin uh, and the guilt of sin. But Jesus comes down, and as a sinless man, and you know, fully man, fully God, he comes on, he takes on our sin, he dies in our place because the wages of sin is death, and he is able to act as a substitutionary uh, being, and he takes on our sin, and he dies, and, he, and our sin dies with him. And Paul acts in a very similar way to this, where he says that um, if he has wronged thee or oweth thee ought, put that on mine account. So we really see how Paul is acting as an example of how Christians should act as an intermediary um, 
when we're ever we're trying to seek peace in the church. Because this is really the point of the epistle of Philemon. Um, and we're going to look at that a little bit later when we look at Colossians, because uh, these are brother kind of letters. Um, but Paul wants to create peace in the church. And so he's acting as an intermediary between Onesimus and Philemon in order to reach that goal. Uh, so in verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even mine own self besides. Um, so this verse leads a lot of people to believe that Paul may have led Philemon directly to Christ himself uh, because he, um, he says, I'll repay the debt. But then he says, I don't really even want to mention what you owe for me, um, even thine own self besides. So it's very possible that Paul had led Philemon to Christ uh, himself. And so in that regard, Philemon would owe um, Paul a great deal. Uh, and so in verse 20, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. So you can see that Paul, even though we don't really know much about Philemon outside of this book, Paul, who knew Philemon personally, um, had a great confidence that, Paul would, or that Philemon would not only do what he asked of him, uh, that he would do more besides. Uh, verse number 22, But withal prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, uh, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So Paul here is saying that um, he wants Philemon not only to help um, Onesimus, but also to prepare a lodging for Paul, because uh, Paul has faith that with the prayers of Philemon in the Church of Colossians, he will get out of prison, uh, which he does. Um, we don't know if he ever goes back to Colossae. We don't know if he um, ever you know, goes back to Philemon's house. But he does get out of um, prison, out of house arrest, for a few years. And then basically he gives a standard greeting for all the, um, the believers who are with him. So this is basically the book of Philemon. So the question is, is how does this apply to our lives today as Christians? How can we use this book to... Um, be more Christ-like uh, in the way that we interact with others and in the way that we interact with God. So really, it's kind of a triangle. It's between, this book is, a, it's between um, three men. Uh, it's Paul, the writer, Philemon, who is the, uh, the object, or who is, Paul is writing the letter to, and then Onesimus, who is the object of the letter. And another way to look at it is that in the context of Rome, you have uh, Philemon, who has been wronged by Onesimus, which is kind of a weird thing for us to think about. Um, as Onesimus being an escaped slave. Uh, because whenever we learn in history classes, we learn about the Underground Railroad, people who escaped slavery, and these people are heroes to us. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be, but in the Roman world, it was a very different context, and it was a very different um, state of being. So looking at it from that context, uh, in that day, Philemon had been wronged by Onesimus. Onesimus had done something wrong to Philemon. Uh, Onesimus does something wrong, he runs away, he becomes saved, but then he comes back to Philemon in order to try to right that wrong. And so we have that story of the Christian who has done something wrong to another Christian, which would be Philemon. And then Paul acts as a peacekeeper. Uh, he comes in, and he wants to have peace in the church. And so he, he doesn't just sit by and watch and say, hey, you know, Onesimus, go, and go, uh, go see Philemon. Go make everything right. He is actively involved. Um, and he acts, uh, he puts himself into the fray in a way to create peace. Um, and so in our Christian walk, uh, we will always, we will be one of those three people. We will either be someone, a Christian who was wronged, a Christian who did something wrong, who sinned against someone else, or we will be Paul, who is a Christian who kind of dives in uh, and acts as an intermediary. And so you can see that how Paul does this is he um, speaks to Philemon, he says, that um, he compliments him. He talks about why he loves Philemon, why he, uh, Philemon is uh, special to him. He petitions for Onesimus and petitions him, petitions him not on the basis of earthly things, but he petitions for him on the basis of um, eternal, an, an, an eternal idea. He wants uh, Philemon to see Onesimus not as a slave who's returned, but as a, uh, a brother in Christ. Um, so if we look back at the book of Colossians, 
Uh, like I said earlier, the book of Colossians is sent at the same time as the book of Philemon. So it's important to realize that these are very connected books. And it's very possible that when Onesimus and Tychicus uh, bring the letters to Philemon, Philemon probably read the letter that Paul wrote for him. And that Sunday, the book of Colossians was read in his house for the first time. So it's important that whenever we're trying to see, you know, what is Paul saying here uh, to uh, Philemon, we can look at the book of Colossians, and that gives us some extra, uh, some extra clues. Uh, so the big thing that we learn from the book of Philemon, a lot of people, um, it is, gets into a kind of a touchy subject um, because the Bible, you know, slavery being a touchy subject, the Bible never condemns slavery outright. There's no verse in the Bible that says you should not be slaves, you should not own slaves. Um, there are different, I mean, in the Old Testament, there are actually laws about how slave owners should treat slaves. Um, this, is Hebrew, this is more of a Hebraic or Israelite slavery. Whenever you see slavery in the New Testament, it's usually the Roman form of slavery, which is different. Uh, but Paul never calls for slaves to break free. He never calls for um, Christian slave owners to free their slaves. Um, basically, what Paul does is that he does something which actually, in a lot of ways, is... Um, more radical at the time, which he doesn't call for abolition, but he calls for equality. And so what does that mean? Basically, um, instead of just calling for people to free their slaves, he calls for them to look at their slaves as brothers and sisters in Christ and to see them as equal. This was a very new thing at the time. Um, you know, whenever you would go to church, basically a slave and a slave master would walk into church and outside the church, you know, they're on way different hierarchies, different lives. But in church, everyone was seen as equal, and people would sit together in basically in the pews next to each other. Uh, whereas this is very different from the outside world, where slaves would often be segregated from their masters. And so we see Paul calling for this unity in the book of Colossians. So we open up to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Uh, let me see. And we're going to start uh, just in uh, verse 5. Oh. And it's important to realize also the context of it. This is being read in Philemon's health. Philemon is there, and not only that, but Onesimus is probably there as well. So verse 5, Mortify, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, For, uh, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil consciousness, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh to the children of disobedience. And the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created them. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, Circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And so this is a very revolutionary um, chapter at the time, especially that last verse, verse 11, because Paul is saying something uh, that hasn't really been said up to this point, which is that in Christ, all are equal. There is no slave or free. Um, there is no Greek or Jew. There's no circumcised, there's no uncircumcised. Everyone is equal in Christ. And so, in a way, this is uh, much more important to, to know and to believe than if there was a verse that just said that slavery should be abolished. Because when we look at American history, right, slavery was abolished like 1865-ish, so about 150 years ago. Um, but people who were slaves or who were former slaves were not seen as equals, even though they were free. Um, and so we, you know, there's Jim Crow laws, there's all this stuff going on. And so it's more important, and this is what Paul really sticks to, is that it's more important for um, people to be seen as equals in the eyes of Christ rather than to just say, oh, we should abolish all of slavery. Um, and also slavery is used as basically, uh, Jesus uses slavery a lot um, as for what we, the attitude that we as Christians should have when it comes to Christ Jesus and his, uh, basically what he has for us. And I'm just going to kind of end on that, what Jesus says, how Jesus uses the word. This is the same word as duomos, 
Um, and it's basically just talking about slavery. So this is going to be in Luke chapter 17. Uh, let's see. And it's going to be verse 7. So this is a metaphor. Um, just right before this, the, uh, the apostles say to the Lord, uh, increase our faith. Um, and so in verse 7 he says, But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Does he thank the servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Um, so this is a really interesting verse because Jesus is saying that we as Christians should have the attitude of slaves. And also, uh, why that's important is because uh, the word humble actually comes from a Greek word, which means to have the attitude of a slave. So to call yourself humble in the Greek times was actually not a compliment. If you said this guy was humble, you basically said that he had an attitude of a slave, which at the time in the Greek and Roman world uh, was an insult and not a compliment. Um, and so what it means as a Christian is that when God tells us to do something, basically he's saying that we should have the attitude of a slave. And we shouldn't expect thanks. We should just say that I, like here in verse 10, that we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm probably going to close off. Um, so does anyone have any questions about anything? I know I kind of went a might have gone to a lot of different places, but anything at all? All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and pray here, and then we'll have a little break uh, before the service. Uh, dear God, uh, just thank you so much for everything that you've uh, given us. Thank you for letting us come um, to church today just to meet with each other, fellowship with each other, um, and to learn from your word. And um, I just pray that as we uh, go out into the world that we would have an attitude that's becoming of servants of Christ, um, and that we could learn to walk in your way more and more. And... Um, that we just continue to learn more about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.